Linux is a fantastic operating system with years and years of work put into it. However, it's important to never forget that Linux is a castle built on top of sand. XKCD2347 sums it up perfectly. All modern digital infrastructure, all of these fancy little applications we've built, all of these different things we rely on, but all of this is being held up by a project some random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since 2003. Now, we'll often joke about the web space being like this, oh, ha ha, left pad, look at all these dumb web developers that are basing everything off of this one library. But the desktop isn't really that different. And that is going to be relevant very shortly. Now today, I want to talk about this. Coordinated Disclosure. One click RCE on GNOME, CVE 2023 43641. This is from October of last year. I was going to talk about it then, but things kind of came up and it just didn't happen. Now, an RCE is a remote code execution, basically a way to execute code on another system that the user didn't intend to execute. And in this case, it was caused by a very simple library a library that you've probably never heard of called libq, a Q-sheet parser library. Now you might rightfully be asking, what in the world is a Q-sheet and why would you want to parse it? Well, a very good reason. They are a metadata format for describing the layout of tracks on a CD. Q-sheets are often used in combination with the FLAC audio file format, which means that libq is a dependency of some audio players, such as Audacious. If it's not a required dependency, it's often at least an optional one. Now this issue was discovered by Kevin Backhouse, who decided to audit libq for security vulnerabilities as it's used in tracker miners, and this is included with GNOME. Now this sounds like a really scary project. Ooh, tracker, ooh, miners, ooh, this must be something weird that GNOME is doing in the background. No, it's just got kind of a weird name. This is used to index the files in your home directory to make them easily searchable. For example, the index is used by this search bar. The index is automatically updated when you add or modify a file in certain subdirectories of your home directory, in particular, including the downloads directory. To make a long story short, that means that inadvertently clicking a malicious link is all it takes for an attacker to exploit the vulnerability and get code execution on your computer. So, in this case, we have a lunar.q file. Let's see what happens when they download it. So, as soon as they downloaded the lunar.q file, it automatically opened a calculator and had text inside of it. That means that downloading this file is executing code on your system that should not be getting executed. Now, a calculator, ah, oh, who really cares? It's just a calculator. The fact that downloading a file can open up a calculator means that you can do a lot more than that. Now, it's not any file, it's specifically a .q file. So the reason this happens is the file is saved to downloads. It is then automatically scanned by tracker miners. And because it has a .q file extension, tracker miners uses libq to parse the file. The file exploits the vulnerability in libq to gain code execution and open a calculator. Q sheets are just one of the many file formats supported by tracker miners. For example, it includes scanners for HTML, JPEG, and PDF, none of which have this issue. To be absolutely clear, the vulnerability was not in Tracker Miners. Tracker Miners is very important though, because it's causing libq to automatically be run upon this file being downloaded. Yeah, libq could be run in other methods, but if Tracker Miners wasn't running it, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. What is the vulnerability then? Well, it's actually a fairly simple one. So libq is quite a small project. It's primarily a Bison grammar for Q sheets, with a few data structures of storing the parse data. A simple example of a Q sheet looks like this. This, even if you've never seen one before, is pretty straightforward. If you imagine the most logical way to write the metadata for a CD, this is probably what you would come up with. Now the issue is specifically in the index. The vulnerability is in the handling of the index syntax. Replacing one of those index statements with this right here will trigger the bug. So there are two parts to the problem. The first is that the scanner 
QScanner.L line 132 uses a toy to scan the integers. This is not the vulnerability, but it lets the vulnerability happen. There is also a bug in a toy. A toy does not check for integer overflow, so it is easy to construct a negative integer. For example, 4,294,567,296 is converted to negative 400,000 by a toy. Now this part is the actual vulnerability. The second part of the problem is that track set index does not check that the index is greater than or equal to zero. It does check if the index is too high. It does not check if the index is too low though. This means that you have the ability to access an index out of bounds. When you do that, you're accessing out of bounds memory. The really bad part is this out of bounds memory is completely controlled by the attacker. They can set whatever negative index they want to set. Whilst being a really serious problem, this is also a really easy thing to fix. We go from if i greater than max index, then say index too big, to if i is less than zero, or it is greater than the max, then we fail. One line change, problem goes away. Whilst this is bad, it could have been a lot worse. It doesn't inherently include any privilege escalation. So if you wanted to access the root account, you would need to use a separate unrelated vulnerability to do so. But if you did know of one, you could use this to execute it. Now the reason for this is tracker miner is broken down into two processes, tracker miner FS and tracker extract, which both run as your current user. The first of which, tracker miner FS, is a background process which is always running, whereas the second, tracker extract, is only started on demand to scan new files. The vulnerability only affects tracker extract because that's where libq is used. Also because tracker miners is so important here, the vulnerability will not trigger if tracker miners is not running. To check if it is running, you can psorx grep track. It usually shows that tracker miner FS is running and tracker extract isn't. If neither is running, which I think is rare, then using the search bar, pressing the super key and type something should automatically restart tracker miner FS. As far as I know, Tracker Miners is quite tightly integrated into GNOME, so there is no way to switch it off. There's certainly nothing like a simple checkbox in the settings dialog. There is some discussion about how to switch it off by modifying your system D configuration, but there's not really any accepted sensible way to do it. It's more like, you know, it's like how we used to not update snaps by doing a weird little hack around it. Now, whilst they have this two-process architecture to make sure the extractor is just not always running in the background, it actually makes the exploit a lot easier. Firstly, it's much easier to predict the memory layout in a freshly started process than in one that's already been running for hours, so the fact that Tracker Extract is only started on demand is very convenient. Even better, Tracker Extract always creates a fresh thread to scan the downloaded file, and I found the heap layout in the threads malloc arena is very consistent. It varies between distributions, so for example, Ubuntu 23.04 has a slightly different layout to Fedora 38, but on the same distribution, the layout is identical every single time. Secondly, because Tracker Extract is restarted on demand, an attacker could potentially crash it many times until their exploit succeeds. Due to the consistency of the heap layout, I found that my exploit works very reliably without needing to use this, but I could imagine an attacker loading a zip file with thousands of copies of their exploit to increase the chance of success when the victim unzips the download. Because when they unzip the download, all of those Q files are now going to be indexed, and when they get indexed, libq runs on them. Whilst I've made this sound fairly easy so far, there was a bit of a problem. The difficult part of exploiting this vulnerability was finding a way to bypass the ASLR. This is the address space layout randomization, which instead of giving you a consistent address space, which is obviously very easy to exploit, it randomizes it to make sure that if you have some sort of way to access memory that is out of bounds, is not always going to be in the exact same place. But what I didn't realize when I started writing the proof of concept is that Tracker Extract 
also has a set comp sandbox, which is intended to prevent this kind of exploit from working. It was a nasty surprise when I thought I had all the pieces in place for a working proof of concept and it failed with the error message, disallowed syscall, close range caught in sandbox. This is what it was supposed to do. But I still failed to understand that I was attempting a sandbox escape here. I just thought I needed to take a different code path that didn't use the close range function. So I tried a different route and it worked, and I didn't give it any more thought until the GNOME developers asked how I'd managed to escape the sandbox. It turns out that I discovered the escape entirely by accident while I was working on the new route. I unwittingly made a change to the proof concept that sold it, but I've since discovered that I could have got the original proof concept working with a one line change. Now all of this libq stuff wasn't just any old bug. If this was just made public, things would have been really bad. Yes, Linux is a fairly niche operating system, but for the people who want to target Linux, which often means GNOME, especially in the case of something like Red Hat, this could have been a really big deal. So when something like this happens, it is instead disclosed to a mailing list called the Distro's mailing list, which is basically a private mailing list, which is intended for issues like this to be discussed and solved and done in unison to make sure patches get out basically as quickly as possible once it is made public. Because this wasn't an Arch Gnome problem, or Fedora Gnome problem, or Ubuntu Gnome problem, or Debian Gnome problem. This was a problem with Gnome. So every version using libq 2.2.1 or older was affected, which is every version of Gnome that existed that was using libq. So, it kind of needed to be dealt with before going public. Whilst all of us hope that projects out there are being audited and code bases are being fixed, oftentimes you'll have issues like this, where nobody realised that it was broken for a really long time, and it was kind of just sitting there, just holding things up, just nobody happened to realise there was a problem yet. So never forget, regardless of how fancy your desktop is, how cool it is to use, there's oftentimes going to be some weird random library, and sometimes it might cause a serious issue that nobody happens to know about, because most people just don't realise it exists. But let me know your thoughts down below. Do you use GNOME? Did you know about this problem back when it happened? I would love to know if you liked the video. Go like the video, and if you really like the video, and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, Scrubs, Lee Berape, linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me, and for once, this is a problem that GNOME has that isn't caused by GNOME.